So here we are, 3,800 miles from the birthplace of DTM, where we're about to embark on our own golden era project with this Mercedes 190E behind me. And we're gonna build it into something that will evoke the emotions of the teams that raced in the early 90s. This is gonna be a mashup of modern and retro. We're gonna be using a modern AMG driveline, but then using retro parts that really evoke the emotions of racing in the golden era. We're gonna build this car with the heart of a modern AMG, but the soul of a race car from the early 90s. Now follow along as we work through the highs and lows of this project and hopefully get this car on track so you can see and hear it and really feel what was so special about the golden era. Cast your mind back to the 80s. Hair was long, colors were bright, the music was loud, and the cars were faster than ever. Competition had always been strong between manufacturers, but for the first time since the Second World War, on-track battles meant as much as success in the showrooms. Over in DTM, rules kept cars close to their road-going counterparts in appearance and design, leading to wheel-banging, paint-swapping battles in the small and agile sedans your low-level corporate manager might drive. Nowadays, super sports cars are the platform of choice, removing the humble roots of the small sedan. It's certainly still good racing, but the atmosphere is different. Every aspect is now calculated to the last possible degree as drivers are informed of every move they need to make thanks to vehicle sensors relaying every data point possible to engineers. The mechanical simplicity is lost on the cars of today, and with it, the spirit of the golden era. With a daunting list of work ahead, a beaten old 190E, and a strict deadline looming not long out, the FCP Euro team has their work cut out to build the ultimate Evo 2 tribute using today's modern technology. We'll kind of rip up the carpet together. We'll just kind of, you know, I'll work on the right side, you work on the left side. Okay, let's freaking do it. Let's do it. We need music. Hit it. Preset one. The project kicked off with a complete disassembly of the 190E. The plan was a full race spec roll cage and interior, so the original blue vinyl had to go. The team carefully removed it to preserve its condition and gave it away to a new home and a fellow enthusiast's project. After the interior came drivetrain removal, but not before taking a look back at the technology that defined this era. All right, so we just pulled the airbox off the 190 project car here, and as you can see, we have CIS injection. So this is um, a really kind of cool, old school, mechanical, sort of quasi-electric injection system on these cars. Basically what we have here is we have a fuel distributor, which is this unit right here, and with all the fuel lines coming off of it. And so each of these fuel lines goes to each individual cylinder here. Now, the airbox sat right here, and so the airflow would go down through here, and it would go past this little plate right here. And as more air would flow, the plate would go further down, and as less air would flow, it would come back up. That plate is directly linked to a piston right in the middle of this fuel distributor. And as that plate goes down, that piston goes down, allowing more fuel to flow to each one of these cylinders. So it's a mechanical solution for injection, really kind of a cool system here. They didn't always run perfect. And a lot of people had issues with them back in the day, but they're really cool systems. And honestly, this led the way to modern fuel injection and what we have today. Like all the things going on, you have an idle switch right here. So on idle, off idle. You have a wide open throttle switch. You have a, your throttle body down here. You got all these little electronic tuning little modules in here. Like this was, this was pretty complicated. <laughs> So basically I'm just pulling all the cowling stuff apart so we can kind of disconnect where everything like the heater hoses, the wiring harness, all the stuff passes through the cow here. So trying to get some access to it, obviously it's pretty dirty. 
We should do like an old school Mercedes lunch, like kielbasa and sauerkraut or something. Oh God. Haven't seen that in a car in years. What? Speedometer cable. This car has an actual physical speedometer cable. So I'm looking at this, look at this right here. So under the, this little guy right here, pull it out. So analog speedo, basically when this cable spins, the speedometer reads faster or slower. Right there, and that goes right into the transmission. So this is that, that is old school tech right there. Oh, look at this. <laughs> I think I'm in park, I think I'm in park, I think I'm in park. As more and more parts were pulled from the 190E, the simplicity of the chassis and shell began to reveal itself. It's easy to appreciate the architecture, especially since there weren't any modern design aids used compared to vehicle manufacturing today. Knowing this is what AMG engineers produced 30 years ago makes those early 90s DTM cars, and especially the competitions they won, all that more impressive. So here we are pulling the harness off in one foul swoop. Uh, we're really not gonna use any of it um, aside from just connectors. So where we need to connect to old things like the headlights or the taillights, things of that nature. It's cute. All right, so here we are in 190E right now. Uh, we have to get all of this tar off the ground. Thank you, Mercedes. They wanted a nice, dense sounding car with no clicks and clacks on it. So they covered the entire floor in, in this tar panel. Basically, the old school way of doing this is just brute force, which is just, just hammer. Just. And yeah, as you can see, if I only got that far in what, 10 hits, how much would this take? So we're gonna try something else. We're gonna do some science. We're going to put a whole bunch of dry ice on the floor, and we're gonna pour, pour some alcohol on the dry ice. Uh, which will make it subliminate and make it basically melt, but dry ice can't really melt because it's not water. But And what that will do is that will cool this tar down really, really cold. And the goal is for it to become so brittle and not sticky that it actually breaks up off the floor. But time will tell. Let's see. Take, some, take the temperature of some of those pieces. Low. <laughs> it just said low. <laughs> oh, it's, it's full, full frozen. So obviously you can see this section came out great. Um, everything broke up pretty easily. And now we're moving on to the front section. We're gonna kind of move around the car, reusing the same dry ice over and over again. But yeah, I'm really happy with how it's coming out. I think we'll have this car done in probably about an hour. All right, so we have most of the tar removed. Um, say about an hour of chipping and moving dry ice around, really wasn't too bad, broke up mostly in big chunks. So I've been cleaning it up, I've been trying to save what I can so we can weigh it. Um, but you can see here, see how gummy this stuff is? And actually you see all the black marks on my hands. Um, that's just from this stuff, it's just so gummy and sticks to everything. That's why we're trying to clean it up as much as we can. We'll suck up what we can with the vacuum cleaner, and then after that we're gonna hit it with a little bit of acetone, uh, which should take all the rest of the tar residue off. And honestly with a little bit of prep, this interior should be ready for paint. Take acetone in a rag and wipe the whole inside down so it's nice and smooth. Why the f is that my job? Because you, like you like cleaning things. You like rags and cleaning things. There you go. I'm gonna go weigh this thing. What's your guess? Ow, oh, 30 pounds. We'll ship it to somebody. 
Oh, I was way off. You are way off, dude. 12? 12 pounds. Not bad. All right, to the trash. Say goodbye. Bye. Still smoking a little bit. Yo, Nate's cleaning? Yo, you showed up. Hi. He broke out broke the pressure washer. This man's clean. Yo, I am so proud, Nate. Here you go. No, 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 no. Honors, come on. I can't get my hands dirty. Yo, no, give it one scrub. Come on. Give it a scrub. One scrub. Come on, come on. Give it. All right, Whoa. Nate, walk away now. No. Woo! <laughs> Actually, Nate, no, 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 come here, come here. What? No, Nate, you're such a little fing five year old. He's also using the wrong stuff to clean. Oh, shit, you're still. <laughs> What am I? What should I? What should I be using? I thought he went inside. I thought he went inside. I thought he went inside. All right, here, let me get you the stuff, bro. I'll be right back. <laughs> so what he doesn't realize is this: is how you get him to help. You do something wrong. He can't stand it. He has to. He's a perfectionist. Yeah, you got to clean the right way. So now he's gonna go get the right stuff. He's gonna clean for me. What? Spray it on. Let's see. So you gotta give it a couple minutes. It's gonna turn purple like, at least should. There's a bunch of crap. Yeah, so it should turn purple like your wheels would with the wheel cleaner. Iron remover is essentially the stuff they use in wheel cleaner. That's why your wheels will turn purple oftentimes when you're cleaning your wheels. Um, so if, Don't use it on steel wheels because it'll remove your wheels. It'll remove the iron from the steel. You're left with just some carbon sitting there. <laughs> oh, shout out Grills Garage. Where, where can you buy that product? fcpuro.com <laughs> I literally didn't come over here for any of this. And I end up cleaning stuff all the freaking time. Yeah, are you like cleaning cars? Ugh. All the time. This is my life. I ain't subscribed to this. Now that the chassis is clean and stripped, Nate and the team are ready to dive into fabrication and test fit the new engine. Stay tuned to see just what kind of fire-breathing monster ends up in the engine bay, right here on the Golden Era Project. What do you think, Nate? You think you're gonna have room or what? Oh yeah. We're going down what? Two cylinders, adding a turbo. Yeah, we'll be fine. My biggest worry is this, which is gonna go away anyway. We've got a big AC condenser on there. It's taking up space. Who needs AC? This is the golden air. No AC in the golden Yeah, you just sweat it out in the 80s. That's why they had sweatbands. I think our engine hoist is from the 80s too. Four-cylinder engines were relegated as low-power workhorses for a significant portion of their existence. Base model cars used them, while better trims were equipped with six- and eight-cylinder power plants. The adoption of turbochargers and the 16-valve head turned the idea of a paltry four-cylinder on its head as they became some of the most fearsome engines to see competition. DTM races weren't an exception, as Ford's Cosworth-built Turbo 4 and the screaming, naturally aspirated mills from Mercedes and BMW wiped the floor with the competition. Those DTM legends birthed a generation of fast sedans with those small, high-performing engines and started a trend that hasn't stopped. Since then, the performance four-cylinder engine has become the most popular platform across nearly every major manufacturer. Hot hatches and rally-inspired vehicles have carried on the development of the platform, and now even luxury brands have joined the fray. Mercedes, BMW, Audi, and even Porsche all have their own version of the performance four-cylinder. While the team at FCP Euro clings to the spirit of DTM with their engine choice, they don't have to play within the same Group A rule set limiting their imagination. Instead, they're taking a page out of Mercedes' modern touring car playbook to give the ultimate tribute more power and flair. This engine was an A45 AMG. And obviously it was horizontally mounted and it's an all-wheel drive car, so we had the axle passing through right here. We're gonna be taking the engine, we're gonna be turning it 90 degrees and putting it in the 190 here. So uh, we're gonna pull some of this stuff off. 
Um, and we're just putting it in, we're gonna just drop it in there, we're gonna see what it looks like, and uh, figure out from there. You got a star so we can detension this? Yeah, go like that. Yep. Okay, here we go. I mean, I really have to say, this engine is a beautiful piece of engineering. It's like, it actually is kind of exciting to be able to properly expose it without plastic covers all around it. You know what I mean? There's a lot of really cool aluminum pieces on it. Just the way it's plumbed, it's very smart and simple. Now I'm coming down slow. Why not? For, uh... Pull it forward an inch. All right, Danny, you just gotta stand there. Okay. Hold it just like that. The yep. Until we're done with the project. So I think looking at this, if we are to leave this oil pan in, obviously we need to do cross member reconfiguration. We won't have a booster. So we, all these lines will be gone. Um, with the exception that we'll have power steering lines, but we can run them real tight up on the frame rail. We do need to figure out power steering pump. Radiator will be right here. The only issue with the other one is the other radiator is going through the, that spot where the, the water air intercooler is, mm -hmm. this line. So this radiator line will have to come around. We'll probably want to do a hard line up on the frame rail from here and then have a stubby to the radiator. We do have to figure out the turbo whether we're going to 180 it or leave it like this. Yeah. I'm looking here, like if we were to leave it like this, we could technically run the exhaust out like this. The only issue being that it's going to get really hot. Hey, we have a lot of hydraulic things going on over here. Yeah. yeah and oil and hot and heat don't necessarily go. Uh, it wants to be in here. Yeah. It literally is it's saying, leave me. Yeah. This is my new home. I'm happy now. Look at this. You see the shirt? The shirt, they're speaking to each other. Good old girl. For all of you following along, this is probably the first time you've seen this car because this car hasn't done anything since significant since 2018. This car was built in the end of 2016 to race in American endurance racing. It was one of like two available six-speed manual C300 rear-wheel drives in the country. And so what we're gonna do today is, it actually needs a clutch anyway. I mean, it has a bunch of custom bits in the transmission, uh, flywheel, clutch, all of that. And we're pretty certain that the transmission from this car will actually fit onto the back of the AMG 133 over there. And we're gonna test fit it, and then we're also gonna test fit some of the flywheel stuff. So we can figure out how to bolt a manual transmission up to an engine that really never had a manual transmission on it. So uh, let's jump in. Good. It's gonna bolt right in, dude. Let's go see if it fits. All right, so here we are. We have the engine that's gonna be going in this beast, um, and we've pulled all of the automatic transmission flywheel, which is a pretty complicated piece of equipment right here. Now we have the flywheel from the C300, and we're gonna go see if this fits. I have preemptively measured this diameter right here, um, which matched, and this pin matched, so we're pretty good there. Another thing to note is on this 2010 C300, we have the crankcase positioning going on right here. That's why this is machined so silly like this, basically to pick up what position the crank, crankshaft's at. Now on these newer models, this is from a 2019, um, you can see this has this really cool little sheet metal ring. It's almost like a little ABS ring. Um, and that lives on the back of the crankshaft and that gives a signal right here to the sensor and tells the engine what point of rotation is at. So, so as we have to figure out how to manufacture a flywheel for this, we don't even have to worry about this anymore, um, which is gonna save a lot of time and money in, in the manufacturing process. Uh, so let's see if this thing fits. So it fits. It's like our ring gear is in the right location for where the starter is gonna have to get it. Um, obviously that's something we need to consider. On the 272s, starter sits on the engine side. Obviously you can see there's no cutouts here for a starter to sit on the engine side. So we're gonna have to either machine a little piece of the block out, or we're gonna have to figure something out there. But yeah, it looks like we got our pilot bearing for this transmission. We have a flywheel. We should have crank position. 
Uh, the only thing it looks that's different is this bolt pattern is different. I can see that this hole lines up, this hole lines up, this hole lines up, and this hole lines up. These two do not. Uh, so we'll have to sort through that, but these are uh, the teething pains we expected, so this, this is pretty cool. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw two bolts in this thing real quick, just to make sure this flywheel doesn't go anywhere. And then we're going to see if the transmission mates up. It definitely is off a little bit. We gotta get, we gotta get the dowel pins right because it's a little bit offset to one side. We got one here, that's good. And so we just need to make sure we can get a clutch in there that's gonna fit right. And basically if the engine's perfectly upright, the transmission's happy. You can rock transmissions over like five, 10 degrees from their normal spot. You don't wanna go too far though because then the oiling system doesn't work in it because they just really splash lubricated. So we have Danny here. He is one of our Mercedes specialists that helps out on the marketing and the catalog side. He knows way more about the Mercedes specific stuff than I do. And I'll let Danny kind of introduce himself and talk about some of the stuff he's figured out on this before we got, even got started. When the first topic kind of came up about how we're going to run a transmission, what transmission we're going to run, there was a lot of discussion kind of going back and forth, I think. Uh, this coming with the dual clutch that it does come with, it's very fast, but it doesn't really have that awesome tribute to the golden era that we're going for here. So in terms of thinking of what we could kind of do with that, uh, my mind kind of went to one of our favorites here, our C300. Uh, it was kind of neat that it had the factory manual transmission. We started kind of thinking about what would be involved in getting that to made up and had the suspicion that it wouldn't be all that intense. So as you can kind of see over here, it went together almost like it was meant to be in some capacity. Let's come back tomorrow, Danny. Let's get this engine up on the engine stand and we'll see if we can get this thing in here, see how far back we can send it. Heck yeah. The only place we're struggling is on the oil pan right now. Does look like the transmission is going to get pretty tight yeah. once we get back about another five or six inches. I don't know if we need to go back that much more than that though. Obviously doing custom drive shafts and stuff, we should always try to get the engine as far as back as possible. But we also want to avoid tearing out the entire transmission tunnel, the entire firewall and redoing all that. You know, that's a lot of metal work that's going to be a lot of time. And so we want this to be as bolted as possible. Let's just see if we can wiggle it back a little more past the track rod. You can see like the bell housing is basically on the track rod right now. We're gonna go a lot more. It's the oil pan is the issue right now, which isn't, this is hopefully not the oil pan we're gonna be using. but we're pulling this front wheel drive oil pan with this front sump and area for the drive shaft. And we're gonna go to the rear wheel drive sump, which will be a big sump right here. Hopefully position things a little bit better for a rear wheel drive configuration on this engine. Uh, now this engine was never a rear wheel drive, but the basis of this engine, this block, was used in a rear wheel drive format in Europe. So we're kind of basing it on that. There we go. Hopefully we don't spill oil all over ourselves. Look at that. To me, that looks like that flange is exactly the same. With their extensive knowledge, the team determined that the M133 engine is part of a family that includes the M274, a longitudinally mounted rear wheel drive version of the same engine architecture. Critically, its oil pan's main sump is at the opposite end, so it'll clear a front cross member like that of the 190E. Thanks to the shared architecture, the M274's components should be just what the Golden Era project needs. All right, so first thing I'm looking at here, everything seems to be good. But when I position the pan all the way forward where it's supposed to go, you can see this little tongue is hitting that pan or hitting that pulley. And looking at the front wheel drive one, it doesn't have that. Uh, so I'm gonna cut this off and we're gonna see if it fits. Attempt number two. Oh, it's already better. You can just, yeah. yeah. It snapped in. Yeah, it's like Legos. 
That's all cars are. They're just Legos. It looks good. I mean, looking around the gap, looks solid. Looks like it fits, no problem. Obviously, we have to sort out the baffling and windage tray situation, make sure that's all good. But what I'm gonna do now is just grab a small little wrench, snug these four down, make sure it sits nice and tight, and then we're gonna go test it in the car. This is, this is gonna be the moment of truth where we figure out if we have to trim the subframe or not. PCV system for, for somebody. Hello? Who California? Is Who is it? It's California on the line. They noticed that our uh, emissions have been removed. Listen, oh, um, this is actually not uh, gonna be on the road, so don't worry about it. It'll be like seven trees max. Thank you. It's always gonna be more efficient. <laughs> no, we need that cell. <laughs> We're over the subframe now in the in the front. So can you get back at all? Back towards you? Y yeah. Okay. I mean, that's the biggest problem is getting the thing back. Because the other thing we could do here, which I'm thinking if we're gonna be putting a steering rack on this thing, what we do is we just cut out the midsection of the subframe, put two eighth inch plates on either side, capture nuts on them, and then do a pl plate with a, like a piece of DOM tube on it. And so basically you just have like a, a removable midsection. So when you have to do this again, you unbolt the midsection, pull it out, yeah. slide it in, bolt it back in. And then we could, we could work on, or use that to fabricate the rack mounts. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking too. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. You were thinking that? Yeah. That's, that's what I was thinking. I, mean, I, yeah. I was thinking the same thing. I don't know if we agreed on the color yet. Oh. Okay, you're gonna have to do that on Hello? the Who is it? It's Aquaman. No, there will not be any water on these pipes. It'll be straight antifreeze with distilled water. We will not be harming any fish, only drain. <laughs> only distilled. Yep. Yeah, I'll let them know. No, I can't I can't help you with the freaking thing we took off earlier. I I took it out of the trash. It's still here. Seven so trees, Max. The engine. This car in. I can't talk right now. We're here. Come on. Uh, technically. <laughs> The M274 oil pan was just what the team needed to keep moving forward, but it led them right into their next challenge. So we're going to be cutting out this middle section across member. Uh, you can see that this is double plated here. See all the spot welds? So we have a double plate for where the engine mount sits. Uh, this I highly doubt is double plated. So we're going to try to cut this middle section out. We're going to weld some eighth inch plates in here as butt plates, and then we'll make sure there's captive hardware on there so we can have a bolt-in center cross member that comes out. Um, I've taken a couple of measurements center line to center line on this is 520 millimeters. Um, and then we're cutting out this middle section. So just basically make sure that when I cut, if anything springs out or springs in, um, we have that baseline measurement. So um, let's give it a go. What's there to lose? What's up, friend? Yep, exactly. You like that? Look, look how nice and straight those cuts are. A rack and pinion steering rack was going to replace the antiquated steering box found in every 190E for better feel and control on the track. However, that was going to require some clever engineering. Oops. I'm sorry, camera. Generally speaking, I'm pretty happy with where it's sitting right now. It'll also make the steering system, which we have to fabricate, much easier. Um, and that's really the next step is we need to go grab the steering parts that we need to fabricate the steering system on this car. So one of the goals we're trying to do is we want these pivot points to be about the same. So there's this thing in racing and chassis dynamics called bump steer. So imagine if you had your steering rack mounted up here and your chassis arm mounted here. And as things move, they're different lengths. As that movement goes, the distance has actually changed slightly. So just a geometric function, right? And so Oftentimes it happens is the steering will go like this as you know as they go over bumps stuff like that and that's called bump steer But you do want to try to keep your pivot points all sort of on the same planes and your lengths Approximately the same um, because that's really going to cut down a bump steer and just make the car more enjoyable to drive on track So you can see here the center line of that tie rod right here is almost lined up perfectly with the pivot point 
on that control arm. And that's, that's exactly what we're looking for. And if we see where the, right here in that neutral state, that ball joint, right where's where my thumb is, that's where the pivot point is on the inner tie rod, right where the same pivot point on the control arm. This steering rack literally could not fit better. Blue tapes are way of life. Perfect. I don't know how equal this is. If this is steered totally, totally equal or not. You can see we got a pivot right there, right where my finger is. So the ball joint is almost perfectly lined up with that. We got a pivot right here, which is a little bit to the left. So probably want to scoot this thing over to the right. But I think that's about it. It's about centered. When we build, rebuild this cross member, we're going to come forward with it and we're going to build some brackets to hold the steering rack in place kind of tie everything together in one, one fabrication session. Obviously we need to have the steering shaft needs to come down here and make this. We still need to have some structure here because this is where the control arm bolts through it. Um, so my idea is if we section out a piece of this, I can get some four inch tube, which is about the size of this, and we can just lay that down and we can actually build a channel inside this basically a half moon channel inside this for the steering shaft to go, um, but also retain all the structure in this box so that we don't lose it for this. And then we can connect it together with the weld and mount. That's my thought. Sounds like it could work. So whenever you're doing eighth inch plates on thin sheet metal, a little tip, always leave yourself an overhang, just a teeny bit. It's always gonna be easier to weld into the thicker metal, it's gonna be the eighth inch plate in this case. So if we leave a little bit of a valley here, we can actually just fill this with weld. So we'll just kind of fill this in, leave a little edge around the edge. So I just, I just drew it up in CAD right here, yep. real quick. And now I come over to my 3D printer, and we mock up the, uh, the design right here. So this is my high tech 3D printer. So basically we'll have one here, we'll have the other one right there, and then we will connect them with a piece of roll bar tubing. Easy peasy. See, I've taken my first design, iteration one, and I've added this little extra se section on it, and we can put a bolt right there. So along with these bolts, really lock this whole thing in. Let's go trace the roll bar tube. Perfect. Now let's go look at it on the car. All right, let's make a metal. Waste very little material. All right, let's go test them out in the car. So I'm really thinking like one's gonna be right here. Second one will be right here, ish. Third one will be right here. Dose. basically locked in the nuts on the back side so we don't need a wrench. We can pop them loose, make sure everything's nice and free. And then now this whole panel can go get welded into the car. In the golden era of DTM competition, manufacturers were tightly restricted by the rules they raced under. 
If it wasn't on the road car, they likely couldn't use it. Those restrictions spurred on road car development and led to both Mercedes and BMW to include radical tech like self-leveling suspension and anti-lock brakes. On the other hand, the Golden Era project is only a tribute, unrestricted by the FIA, so modifying suspension and steering systems will allow FCP Euro to retain the spirit of the era while bringing those systems up to modern standards. Now that we have the engine in location, the goal is to sort of start fabricating all of these mounts to lock the engine in location. So uh, first up, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get that transmission brace fabbed up so we can get this out of here and get the strap out of here. That means we can go up and down as much as we want on the lift and we can start fabricating the front motor mounts. Golden era, training mount coming up. Just have these tiny little welds holding these washers nice and centered there. What that's going to do is allow this bolt to center this bushing between these two holes. So you can see I could take this um, and then in addition to that we're actually running two washers in between just to make sure we have enough space. Give ourselves a little bit of wiggle room. Just like that. Now we're going to throw a nut on the other side and this can be snug down in the car. So there we go. So now this you can see is notched out here. This little special notch, that's to fit in the frame rail. We can get everything nice and square. Obviously I've given some room so we can move forward and backwards. But that's what it's gonna look like right there. Now you can see both mounting points on either frame rails. Now we just need to connect all the dots. Do you guys want to build a piece of this with me? Should I walk you through the steps and how we do this? All right, let's do it. Uh, so first we're starting out with just some raw material here. I want it to land on the bar a little bit back from the edge so these two welds basically don't overlap each other. So this is gonna make it nice and strong here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to go and saw this off right here so I don't have any significant excess material and I'm not working with a big long piece of pipe. All right, we're gonna wipe this guy down. We just wiped down the outside of the pipe, but we definitely wanna clean the inside. If you look down there, you can see uh, there's some sediment and stuff in there. Obviously, that's not gonna affect us right now, but when we go, go to weld it, if there's oil or debris in there, that's gonna contaminate our welds and make it not as pretty. So definitely wanna clean the inside of the pipe as well. Look at all that stuff coming out of there. Um, because I did this on an angle, I'm gonna take this, hold it perfectly horizontal, just give it a little scrape, and that's gonna be my center line. Um, I'm going to do the same thing up here because when I go to drill through this, obviously I want everything lining up and not being tweaked at all. So we need to make sure the pipe is clocked accordingly. So now what I'm doing is I'm just getting my line that we created here, you can see that my Sharpie line, and getting that perpendicular to the drill bit. Uh, but obviously you can see we need to make some adjustments up top to make sure this is going to work. All right, so now what I've done is I've made it so I can cut down and you can see, if I just outline, you can see that that Sharpie line is aligned. Let's see, right there. So now we're just gonna cut straight down uh, with this hole saw and magic will happen. All this little thin stuff here, uh, we wanna get, get rid of, we'll grind that right off because you don't want to weld this thin area because that's not going to give it any structural integrity. Once we notch this and allow this to drop down, we should have a really nice fitment right there. So you can see I'm right on center line. So what I'm going to do, now we're going to set it up perpendicular and we're going to just basically plunge straight through here, put a nice U shape on that so it ties right in there. 
Modern Mercedes engine mounts are built for comfort, luxury, and occasionally speed, but each has some kind of rubber or fluid damper within them. The Golden Era Project isn't a modern Mercedes, nor is it a streetcar. It's a purpose-built track machine. Using steel plate and tubing exclusively for the engine mounts eliminates all damping forces and will allow the M133 to put every bit of its power to the rear wheels. Now let's go clean it up. Now it's time to tie it all together. So we got this thing pretty well tacked up. So we have multiple tacks on every plate. Obviously it's all tied together. Now we're going to build the other side um, and then we'll final weld this thing up and we'll have a motor mount. Nate Vincent stand test, all 80 pounds. Yep, we're good, dude. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is 85. I had barbecue for lunch today. And I, my, I finished thing. my whole thing. <laughs> yeah, man, this thing is solid. <laughs> Not bad for just tacked in. Let's move on from this, because I can't look at this anymore, because I spent way too long looking at that. With the engine and transmission mounted in place, it's time to address the suspension. <laughs> More Mercedes catalog sleuthing has come up with a handful of other parts that will help turn the 190E from an 80s relic into a modernized DTM tribute machine. To see just how they do it, follow along on the next episode of the Golden Era Project. I'm just literally going through the site, finding ball joints, checking them. Oh no, that would have been perfect. So here we are under the W204. We're actually going to be using a lot of the front suspension from the 204, uh, mostly because it has a really strong wheel bearing, has a really great brake setup. We can use the C63 setup. Um, coilovers are readily available for it. Um, so we're gonna try to use some of this, but as you can see here, it doesn't have a single pivot point on the front um, McPherson strut like the 190E does. It actually has this sort of multi-pivot point. So we've taken this off. We have it over there next to the other one. Now we're gonna go compare them and see what we can do. Now, one of the other nice things about this is this runs a steering rack in front of the subframe, just like we fabricated on the, on the Golden Era project. So it's gonna allow us to connect our steering rack to these tie rod ends, which will tie right ni nicely into this knuckle. And it'll give us a lot of, uh, basically, a lot of solutions for one, one challenge. So let's go look it up. A critical component of a competitive race car is its suspension. As with any regulated racing series though, there are parts of the suspension you can change and parts you can't. In DTM, all bodywork was required to be identical to the road cars, severely limiting the physical space for excessive customization. This, along with McPherson struts as standard up front, meant engineers had to get creative from the factory to be competitive. We've cut the spring perch out and now we're cleaning up all of the spot welds and getting rid of the rest of the stuff here. Basically what we're doing is we're ditching the spring on the control arm. We're gonna be running a true coil over here. Uh, so we gotta get rid of this. Since Mercedes engineers developed a multi-link rear design, it offered superior adjustability over the E30 M3, allowing the race teams significantly more combinations for camber, toe, and caster to eke out every possible ounce of grip on the track. I was hoping the whole thing would come out, not just the ball joint. I'm hoping that we can find a ball joint that's pressing that has the right taper to match the, the C63. All right, so right in front of me, I have the original W201 190E front strut. Uh, now, there's a couple things I want to note on this. Obviously, very small break. Um, this is an old school sort of sealed bearing, really not not the strongest thing out there, especially for track use. The other thing is this has a divorced spring and shock setup. So this is the McPherson strut, has a strut bearing up top, um, our pivot point right here. 
um, but it doesn't have a spring on it. Whereas a coilover obviously is a much more compact design as we're gonna try to move to. There was actually a steering stop on here. And then across here is where the um, steering box actuated. Now, because we've switched to a steering rack, we need to move that over to around here. So the front mounted steering rack can actually actuate the steering. So there's a bunch of changes we need to make here. And so we found it easier actually to go straight over to a 204 setup right here. So we have the C63 uh, W204 knuckle here. And this is really nice. It has a bolt-in wheel bearing, which makes changing your wheel, wheel bearing so much easier. And it has a really stout wheel bearing. And actually we have an old coilover from the old race car here that I'm using for mocking purposes. Now you can see this is gonna bolt to that, which is a really nice clean setup. Um, and one of the concerns is because this has the dual, you know, control arm and a track rod, whereas this only has a single control arm with a single pivot point, we're concerned about the location. Stock 190 W201, small bearings, small brakes, kind of antiquated design, divorce spring, all that sort of stuff. And now we're gonna go over here, same setup, coilovers, we got big brakes, big wheel bearings, front steering rack, everything we need, and it's gonna mount right to the 190 right here. Let's go do it. Mercedes, doing the same thing on all their cars forever. We're definitely going to need to do something to this upper bearing. Not exactly sure what yet. For now, for mocking up, so I'm not holding nothing there, I'm just gonna pop this bearing off and just hold this strut up with that. All right, let's pop this control arm in. With some modern Mercedes parts, the 190's suspension update began to fall into place. The W204's coilovers were a shockingly close fit, retaining the geometry and stroke required by the 190E. We can only imagine Mercedes past engineers seeing their older design functioning so well with current parts. Including the C63 knuckle only furthers that connection while providing the team a perfect fit with the new steering rack. And we're coiled up almost all the way up on the coilover. So we do need to make sure we are clearing over here, which is nice. It's the one nice thing about using like a whole assembly from a car. It's the wheels clearing the coilover, as you can see. And then obviously we need to connect a tie rod. Yeah, I think this is the solution. So, you know, we proved out that this will work. Now it's just a matter of doing the fine tuning details and making it work. That's like the, the upper echelon of ride height that we'll have, because that's almost raised all the way up and it's pushing it out so the fender flare will get filled right up, which will be awesome. Suspension test fit. So we need to connect this to this and the original Mercedes ball joint, which we have the cup of right here, is kind of a weird old unit with it has a shaft or the bolt that goes through in the side and locks in place, all that. Um, and what we're trying to do is find a ball joint that will fit into the control arm, nice and snug like this one would, but then also has the same taper as the Mercedes W204 knuckle. So here we are, I'm on the site. I'm gonna search the entire site and I'm just gonna type in ball joint. But what I'm doing is I'm just scrolling through these photos. I'm looking, so here's the Mercedes setup. These guys right here look pretty similar to that. So this might be something to earmark that might fit in there. These Porsche ones might work. Oh, no, see, these are these Porsche ones are kind of like the 190E ones. They don't have a taper on them. They're just a shaft that has a pin go through the side of them. And obviously we can't do that. We need to have something with a taper. I did come across one from a Mercedes ML that looks like it might have an opportunity. So we're gonna go back in inventory and we're actually gonna pull it out of the shelf and look at it. So I'm gonna bring this control arm as a something to check it against because this is the correct control arm for here. Let's go check it out. What's up, man? So we got KEO2C25, it's our lo location. So, KEO2C25, right there. So we're gonna pull this out of the box, we're gonna take a quick peek at it and see if it's gonna work. Ooh, it's looking good so far, it's a nice big, big boy. 
So one of the things that made that made this one stri strike out to me is A, it's for an ML or a GL, so it's for a big car. So that means it's gonna be a big, strong ball joint. The other thing is it has this really cool mechanism where it actually screws in. So it actually is like a little coilover collar so we can actually screw it in and tighten it down. And look at this taper, that looks pretty beefy. So kind of just holding it up to the other one. It looks like that might fit. The taper does look a little different. This, this taper looks greater, but there's only one way to find out. So we're gonna borrow this real quick. I'm just literally going through the site, finding ball joints, checking them. Oh no, it would have been perfect. Maybe we go machine this and make it, make it work. This is a nice little like thread in guy. Oh, that's, that's nice. And put a little straight. shim in there. It's not a taper, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a straight. So either we can machine that or we can just put, just drill that one straight. Yeah. It looks like it has a teeny it bit of taper. Does have a taper, right? Yeah. Teeny, teeny that. taper, but not a lot. Like so it, that would be hard to... This would be so easy to, and you could all space up for yeah. roll center if you wanted to. With some modern Mercedes parts, the 190's suspension update began to fall into place. The W204 coilovers and knuckles fit perfectly with the new steering rack, leaving the lower ball joint as the missing variable. So Nate isn't here right now, but now that we have our Scheffler wheel bearings here, we're just going to test fit to make sure everything's going to work properly. Since we're kind of getting close to the end of some of our deadlines, we want to get everything squared away as early as possible. So we're going to take our nice, beautiful wheel bearing and hub assembly. We're going to stick it in our C63 hub. We're going to be relatively complete with our C63 front hub conversion, which means we can then run our C63 calipers, our C63 discs, and most importantly, some really nice suspension that's normally going to be targeted towards the W204 chassis. But in this case, we're going to be able to run it on our 190E here. So slap this guy in and we'll be good to go. And then I'll throw a couple more bolts in, grab some tools and torque it down. Danny just figured out we found the right tie rods. We've been searching for the right tie rods for a while. Uh, we probably tried out six or seven different sets of tie rods, uh, but we ended up with an E90 M3 tie rod. It fits the E46 rack with this thread up front, but it's also a significant length longer, and it has the same thread as the Mercedes uh, tie rod end. So we actually have E46 rack, we have E90 tie rod, and then we have Mercedes tie rod end. So it's a very unique suspension on this car, but it all works together, as you can see. Um, we have a nice quick steering ratio, which is gonna be awesome when we're driving this car on track. In addition to that, we have, we don't have ball joints in here, but we just sort of have bolts holding things together. Um, just really mocking everything up, making sure everything's gonna fit right. The next part to make fit was a D088 intercooler from a Volvo C30. So here we go, we got the intercooler sitting here. Um, you can see we're actually lifting it up underneath the hood to so make sure we get it as high as possible. And you can see this is really that channel. This is that top channel. So we'll have a piece of uh, plastic or carbon that's gonna basically deflect the air. So we have a channel of air going through the intercooler and a channel of air going through the radiator. Keeping the coolant and charge air cold is paramount for optimal performance on track. If this DTM tribute was to run as hard and as long as the race cars from the golden era, ensuring the intercooler and radiator each had their own airflow was key. We built this uh, quick little frame here. Um, obviously we cut the old stuff out. We wanted to make sure we had a divorce intercooler um, and radiator. Now on top of that, you can see that we've actually taken this turbo. We're not gonna hold it on with tie wraps, but what we've done is we've actually orientated it 180 degrees from its original orientation. So we're making a custom plate that's going to do the adaption because this is a twin scroll and there's two, two inlets in the exhaust side. But what that allows us to do is basically we're gonna connect here to here directly and then off of the intercooler straight to the intake of the car. Now, that being a smaller volume of air, that's going to make when the turbo spools, the engine's gonna feel it right away. That's gonna really impact throttle response and give us a nice crisp throttle response, which in the end, that's what we're going for with this engine. We don't, we're not worried about making 600 horsepower. We want 400 horsepower or 350 horsepower, but we want it to be just like that Cosworth National Aspirated engine would be, where when you tip in the throttle, you get the power when you need it. Now, the other thing we've been working on is the downpipe. So uh, we have a downpipe that we've sliced up here. And basically, we've had to section out a little bit of the chassis 
to make sure we have clearance for that downpipe to move down here. Obviously, this is going to be one of the hottest sections of the engine, this whole exhaust system. So we really want to make sure we have clearance around the steering, stuff like that. And we're going to do some heat shielding in the original factory heat shield here to make sure we keep the heat out of the driver's compartment of the car and make it going underneath the car where we want it to be. To make up for this little uh, section that we've cut out here, uh, we're actually going to do the old uh, Kazi trick with the Ford Escort RS and the Ford Escort Cosworth and we're going to basically tie an X. So we're gonna have an X that ties into our cage that goes to either strut top, just like that. And that's gonna give us super rigid strut tops, make sure these things aren't flexing around even though we took away a little bit of structure there. The last little bit is we are working with some people to make the strut tower tops. The goal is I'm hoping to get the tower to sit on top of this rather than underneath it. That's gonna give us a little bit extra length uh, for the spring. Remember the Evo 2s run really low in the front. The fender cuts actually come right up to this line here. Um, so they run really low in the front and we want to make sure we're not sitting on the bump stops the whole time. So we need to make sure we have a little extra movement for the suspension uh, so we're not right up at the end of, this, of the coilover all the time. Very nice. Just a few things going on here. Just a couple. Just a couple. So because it's going straight from the fab shop to the paint shop, we really need to make sure some of the interior bits are figured out. So we have our shifter right here. Um, that's gonna be mounted right up on the X. X marks the spot. So we're gonna have to build um, stands that basically pedestal this thing up in the air a little bit. And then what's gonna be really cool, we're gonna have a fully exposed shift linkage. So um, the shift linkage will come straight forward to the transmission right here. Um, but the challenging part of this is we need to sort of build an area here where the shift linkage can pass through the floor, but that we can seal off with a rubber boot. So we're gonna build a little structure there out of sheet metal that allows it to come straight through and then we'll have a little rubber boot on there to seal it off so no exhaust gases or heat or anything comes into the cabin when the car is being driven. This is, this is scientific measuring. Approximately Approximately 185. It's an 89, so that looks like 185. So, I would almost say real quick, why don't we just drop this thing, put it on the bench next to that thing, see what it looks like. Because this is like a three, what is it? 309, that would be a 314, 327. 327? Yep. It's a three, three long gear ratio slow. You know how we tell gear ratio? So that's what we do. This is the gear ratio explained. You see the red? Now, do you see this mark right here? So now I'm gonna spin this around and we're gonna watch that mark. So, ready? Uno. Dos. Trace. And maybe 25% more rotation? Same spot. So, yeah, 3.25 or whatever you said it was, 3.27. The higher the ratio, close to the gears, which means every time you shift, the RPM doesn't drop as far. So typically in racing cars or track cars, we want that to be relatively close because you really are using higher RPM and you want your rev, rev range to stay close. You're not really looking for highway fuel economy. Uh, whereas this car was built, it was actually looking for highway fuel economy, low RPM on the highway. So that's why it has a very low ratio diff. One thousand six hundred and 11 millimeters, go down to the bottom, 1,611 millimeters. We should note that before we take this one out and then obviously we can test out that one and whatever. It looks like the flange size might be different so that might be a drive shaft shop thing. But yeah, let's get this out of here. Being able to run the W204 gearbox was a critical win for the team, but has required some custom parts Along with a new clutch assembly, a custom-made drive shaft is a necessity. So they're pretty close, but they're not exact. So the back cover uh, where the mounts are, we have to swap over, but this back cover doesn't look like it's gonna swap directly onto this diff. Um, and then we have to get these ears off, these, these ears and make sure that the splines are the same inside. Um, but from general stuff with mounting points, stuff like that, they're pretty much the same. So we're gonna see what we can do. 
To get the snappy response of the early 90s DTM machines, the 190E was going to need a shorter axle ratio. After some intense searching, the team settled on a 3.46 ratio differential from a W203 C240. Paired with an OS Geekin limited slip differential, it's just what the turbocharged Mercedes needed. It's, it's carbon paper. Paper fiber drive shaft. <laughs> Science, right? Yeah, so what we did is we actually took an old shipping container um, because it's about the OD of the drive shaft that we know we're gonna have to put in this thing. And we threw it up there and we mocked it out so we make sure we have clearance everywhere. Uh, here we need to cut out the center bearing support here. But aside from that, this drive shaft should function 100%. With the help of some cardboard tubing, the team figured out all of their measurements and cleared the tunnel in preparation. I am loosening up the bolts for the subframe. Unfortunately, these back ones I can't get the impact on. So you gotta go old school on them. It's hanging on for dear life. Keep going, keep going. Yep, you're clear. Up. We're gonna do some reinforcing on it. We're gonna get rid of this. Throw this in the trash. And make sure it's all good to have 400 horsepower going through it and slide sideways around Lime Rock and Circuit Legends. Building a new wiring harness for the custom engine management was the next step in the process. The team brought in an old friend and engineer from FCP Euro's IMSA team who flew in from Canada to lend his expertise to the complicated wiring harness. My name is Karim Antaki, I'm from Canada. I've worked as a race engineer for the last almost 20 years. Uh, we're here building this awesome car here at FCP Euro. Hopefully it'll be very fast and very furious. Theoretically, to have a vision, you have to see where everything and all the electrical parts are located so you have an idea of actually how the wiring is going to pass through bulkheads and to make every, sure everything is going to have the adequate wire size uh, and the adequate power to make everything run properly. So it's the question at the start to have the vision. Once you have the vision, everything else becomes a mechanism. So at the end of the day, uh, uh, I think we're at the start of a beautiful project. I just need to figure out which box goes where first. For this engine, we're using a Motec M141, which is basically uh, typed for high pressure injections and high pressure injectors that are built specifically for this engine. The piezo injectors will actually be controlled with a higher voltage than the regular injectors. So therefore, this means that it cannot be controlled with a regular setup. It's got to have something very specific to it, which Motec has actually made a very good controller for that specific injector. Just like the BMW N54 engine, it's got the same type of injectors for this one. Hey bud, you have an N54 yet? You have a six-pack of coils and a six-pack of injectors? <laughs> That's the best thing I've ever heard. Three, two, one. Um, we can do a rear bulkhead connection. Uh, if you want to do an embossed plate that comes out a little bit, that might actually be a little bit nicer than to have the guitar string going in the back. If the plate comes out two inches here, mm -hmm. it could actually looks like it, it's actually doing something cool, yeah. which it doesn't need to do much. But as long as we clear nice the wiper, plate. I think it's the only thing we have to make sure of. Because the yes. wiper, this is a bolt for the wiper, yeah. and then there's one there, and well, I believe there might be one on the what back. What I want to do, plate. it's going to look nicer if it comes out on an angle like this than if it's actually strung out in the middle, because there's absolutely no room in there. Yep, I, I get you. Yeah, I can have some. I can have something fabbed up like that. Sure. I remember just like the NW when they put plastic, usually they're trying to hide something. Yeah. That's exactly what they're doing. So yeah, we can do this. We can have a nice plug here with a bit of strain relief there, even a little bit further if we can. So this is going to be plugged in with a round connector. Yep. You realize there's a potential to have 96 connectors in there, so I'm going to have to count exactly how many wires and get the right plug. Okay. So we can't be like, let's put more wires. Yeah. Good. All right. And cut. With a lot of work left to do for Kareem on the engine harness, the team moved their focus onto thinning down the chassis harness. Retaining functioning lights is about all that's essential. Everything else will be cut out for weight savings. 
If I know a pinout of the wires coming through here, that when I connect to it, trunk's done. So that's my goal right now. So we're just gonna do some quick testing. We got a jump pack in here, some jumper cables, and we're gonna see some lights light up. Blinker on the right side. Right. We got black and white. That's turn signal on the left side, looks like. The thing I love about building cars or cars in general is like when you really dig down, they're so very simple. They're just a, just stacking and stacking of, of systems on top of each other that it, it becomes complicated. But when you really get down to each individual thing, it's actually very simple. So the taillight harness is sorted. I'm just gonna fold it over on itself, tape it again. That means all the wiring in the trunk is done with the exception of fuel pump wiring. We're gonna look through every single system that we have, make sure we have the pinout, make sure we have the logic behind the, how the functioning of each individual item so we can make sense of it. Make sure there's nothing we're forgetting because nothing sucks more than making a harness and forgetting stuff. So at the end of the day, uh, it is what it is. We need to go through the whole hash list and make sure everything works fine. I'll get back to work and I'll let you know what we've done uh, tomorrow morning. How does that sound? See you then. Cool. I uh, stayed until 10 working on this beautiful car and then uh, went to sleep for a couple of hours, mulching over the project in my head, trying to second guess myself. In all progression, since I arrived, we identify which plugs actually did what on the engine because we had a donor engine with everything unplugged. Uh, we identify the bulkhead connectors, which wire have which, which function. We identify how we're going to plug it, um, plug this connector to the firewall and then from the firewall to the ECU, the pinout's been done. Uh, we've made the logic system for the electronics to control the whole uh, power distribution for the car. Uh, we've allocated the space in which we're going to put it in. We know where the other modules are going to be. So the next step is going to have uh, fab the car so that we can actually install the boxes and modules into the system. And at that point, uh, we can fire away the chassis loom at that point and make everything work perfectly and have the outputs ready for when we receive the engine loom so we can plug everything in and test the functions when we get it so it's progressing faster in my head than uh, actually on the, on the car itself but once the parts start to coming in uh, it's going to be a nice nice cascade of installation so it's pretty cool what we've done so far it's a good start to a project that uh, has a lot of question marks on it so it's pretty good So I'm not supposed to say this, nobody asked me to do it, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Big shout out to the FCP guys. The place is kick-ass, it's amazing, coming from the outside and the outside. I've been, I've been looking at the shop through the internet and through what these, the content guys have been doing. It's pretty amazing, I'm coming in here to, to work on a project and I'm impressed by the whole organization and the company. So good luck guys, keep going in that direction. All right, so this is, this is like the pinnacle of the dry fit right now. So we have basically everything bolted together, sort of, kind of maybe how it's going to be but we're getting ready to head off to the fab shop for the cage to be done from there we're going to do the exhaust system a bunch of little odds and ends that are going to finish this thing up uh, but pretty much right now we have the radiator we have the intercooler we have the headlights kind of all mapped out in the front we have the engine located where it's going to be we have shifter hooked up we have the wiper back installed we have suspension on it that's actually functional we have the dash installed we have temporary seat mounts pedals installed fuel cells sitting in the back Basically everything sort of mapped out where it's gonna be so that we can hand it off to the fabrication shop, they can build the cage, and then it's gonna go from there to the paint shop and get all shiny and get some new body work put on it. All right, let's, let's roll. Here, we gotta actually roll that out of the way. All right. The 190E is off to the body shop for roll cage fabrication and paint, just a handful of weeks away from deadline. Is there enough time to have the custom fab roll cage installed? And will the Evo 2 body panels arrive in time for paint? Find out on the next episode of the Golden Era Project.